Hi there from Chicago. This is Big Ten Today presented by Gatorade. Thrilled to have you with us. Anthony Heron and Mike Hall here with you. You had a long weekend, sir. I did. Yes, I did. you did. But I'm not a big believer in sleep. I think it's overrated, <laughs> overhyped, and so I'm here. Bright-eyed, bushy-tailed with you. How much sleep would you get when you were playing in Iowa every oh, night? Uh, well, my freshman year or my senior year? Yes. Those would be two very different answers. I didn't sleep much as a 17-year-old <laughs> freshman playing Big Ten football. By the senior year, I slept a bit more. Ross Dellinger of Yahoo Sports, you're a man dedicated to sleep, right? A good eight, nine hours each evening? <laughs> I try, but uh, haven't gotten that lately. I, I took the red eye Sunday night back uh, from Oregon to, to D.C. So I'm not on a whole lot. I'm running on, running on fumes, guys, running on fumes. <laughs> good. Well, we happen to plan on taking advantage of that. In 25 seconds, you have potential breaking news. Let's start <laughs> off with our big story. The game of the year on paper was this past weekend. Turned out to be just that in real life. Twists, turns, oddities, excellent play, coaches out maneuvering one another, a last-minute drive to win the game, clock expiring mid-play. It was a thrill ride of a contest. The Ducks not only won, but won their first ever game against an AP top two ranked team in the regular season. A signature victory for head coach Dan Lanning. And it ended right there with the quarterback for Ohio State, Will Howard, sliding as the clock expired. The clock expired because he only had six seconds on it at the point. Now, the play before, there was 10 seconds on the clock, but there were 12 men on the field for Oregon. It turns out that was on purpose by Oregon, which is brilliant <laughs> and flawed. We want to get to Ross on more of this. What happened was it forced Ohio State to play against 12 men, which meant it was likely there would not be a big play, which there wasn't. The penalty happened. Time came off the clock. It was only five seconds. So then Ohio State was stuck with only six seconds to go, and it ended up costing them. Ross, what is the potential breaking news we have on this? Yeah, Oregon essentially traded having an extra defensive back on an obvious passing down for a five-yard penalty in four seconds being burned off of the clock. Uh, it was a pretty savvy move, right, that's kind of now garnering uh, some, some scrutiny from the NCAA Rules Committee. Steve Shaw, who's the NCAA Secretary Rules Editor, uh, t told me this morning in an interview that they are actively engaged in examining this play for possible action. Now, uh, he didn't really go any further. Uh, what action could they do? Well, if you look in past situations where the fair play component of the rule book is violated, which I think you could say uh, this did violate it, um, you, you look at what they've done, the Rules Committee in the past, and they basically released an interpretation, Mike, that basically directs officials in future games to handle situations differently. So in this one, uh, you would think the way you would handle it in the future would be to return the game clock to its original time of 10 seconds instead of having run four seconds off and being at, at six seconds for the final play. There would have been 10 seconds off there, potentially allowing uh, Ohio State two plays, uh, a completed pass or, or run like you saw Will Howard, and then a, a, a possibility for a game-winning field goal. Um, so we'll see maybe later this week. I would expect it pretty quickly. That there's going to be some kind of address from the Rules Committee on the play. Now, they can't change the rule right that is a year-long process that's usually done in the off season but they can deliver what they call an interpretation bulletin to officials to monitor for future games it, it, it's it seems like the right thing because this was undeniably legal and brilliant yeah. by Dan Lanning. And also, it has to be changed going <laughs> forward. You, you can't manipulate the rules. He did nothing wrong. He did everything right. It was smart. But you can't let other people keep doing that. Right. It's a loophole. And, and pretty frequently when you're expecting late in game in the final minute of a game or final two minutes of a half where the rules can adjust a bit, especially at the end of a game, depending on who has the lead, who has the football, whether or not you're expecting a 10-second runoff, depending upon who the penalty is actually committed by. Dan Lanning was able to thread that needle brilliantly for his football team. I actually just spoke to Brett Bielema a little bit earlier this morning about this particular scenario. Didn't impact his team with the Illini during the win they had over Purdue, but you know this is going to be one of those things that has some reverberations 
throughout the sport. And Brett Bielema even said he anticipates something in the not too distant future that would be adjusted, that would be tweaked, where perhaps this loophole isn't able to be taken advantage of in the same way. A worthy storyline to discuss coming out of that game. However, the big picture impact, Ross, was that Oregon got this mammoth win, the right. best win of Dan Lanning's career as a head coach there in Eugene. What was your takeaway from the Ducks? Yeah, well, my main takeaway was Dylan Gabriel at quarterback really grabbed my attention. Uh, I think he had four completions of at least 30 yards. Uh, all of them in the air went at least 20, 25 yards. Um, he, he just throws a beautiful deep ball uh, in Oregon's offensive line, which was, you remember, Anthony, a weakness kind of early in the season. They were moving pieces around. They gave him enough time in, in this one to, to hit those deep passes. I think Ohio State entered having not allowed a single pass of over 30 yards and Oregon and Dylan Gabriel did it did it four times and how about the receivers right you you got Evan Stewart a transfer from Texas A&M basically the third or fourth option on the team had a huge game Tess Johnson saying these guys really got open they were able to just just get open against Ohio State's secondary uh, some members of which are potential first round draft pick. So uh, that that stuck out to me more than anything. We know about Jordan James at running back for the Ducks and all that, but really what we got to see uh, was was uh, in, a, in an Oregon offense with Dylan Gabriel that um, can hit the hit the deep deep pass against the best best teams in the country and that's huge for the Ducks going forward. It's a lot of fun, Ross, when a game that's been so anticipated for so many weeks and months actually lives up to that hype. And Mike, so pop quiz hot shot. There was a team a few weeks ago that I told you was excellent at the time, but was furthest away from their ceiling amongst the excellent teams in America. Who was that team? The Quackers of Eugene. Uh, no, it was the Oregon Ducks. Actually. Oh, I was yes, so close. I just like telling you, you're wrong. But this is now Oregon approaching their ceiling. This is a team that's ascending at the time when they need to be ascending, approaching midseason. And you see the way that Oregon is capable of playing when they are hitting on all cylinders in the line of scrimmage, where just last week I was saying this is the most physical version of Ohio State that we've seen under Ryan Day. And I still believe that. But the Oregon Ducks were able to respond to the challenge up front presented to them by the Buckeyes. And an offensive line for the Ducks, they gave up seven sacks through their first two games of the season, more than they had given up in any of the previous full seasons. Quiz me on how many they've given up since. The, well, zero. That's right. None. Zilch. Nada. Nothing. They've given up no sacks in the last month. The offensive line is playing at a much higher level right now for the Ducks, so that allows Dylan Gabriel, who's already playing at an extremely high level, to be even better, even more combustible as a passer and a runner. You see how the flamethrower he has in his arm talent can be accentuated by time in the pocket. That's a part of why Oregon's able to play at this level. And then also, yes, they also had Jordan James as the first running back to gain over 100 yards this season on that Ohio State defense. You've been talking all year about Ashton Gentry being a front runner for the Heisman Trophy, and he absolutely is. Right. To Ross's point, Dylan Gabriel's in that conversation now. Yeah. He's going to be in yeah. for the foreseeable future for sure. Ross, what about the flip side? Anthony pointed out this is a very physical Ohio State team. This is by no means a bad loss. You lose to the number two team in the country on the road by one point driving at the end. But still, what is the takeaway from the losing Buckeyes? Yeah, the, no way this is a bad loss, right? I mean, if you look at, you know, probably the losses from any, any one loss team right now, this would be, quote, the best loss, right? On the road to the number one or number two ranked team in the country. Uh, it, it, it's, it's something that hurts, especially because it's a conference loss when it comes to the advancing to the conference championship game. But this one, if they're 11 and one, won't, won't keep Ohio State out of the playoff. Uh, but what is concerning, um, is is the the secondary Anthony? Uh, you got all American guys like Denzel Burke, um, who who you know, for lack of a better phrase, were, were burned a few times in that game by Oregon's receivers in in Dylan Gabriel, and then safety Caleb Downs just didn't seem like he was around too much. You know, it did we do we didn't we didn't see him a ton in, involved, and that really surprised me. The the way Ohio State's secondary was um, exploited a little bit. Uh, by Oregon was was probably the biggest um, biggest surprise of the game and and certainly hu you know hugely costly when you when you look at uh, some of the big plays and late in that game we saw 
a kind of a freshman mistake, right? We talk about Jeremiah Smith a lot, and he had a massive costly penalty on an offensive pass interference in the final seconds of that game that backed Ohio State, then basically in field goal range, out of field goal range. And the way that the game ends up finishing, where he's talking about some of those critical moments where it's a razor-thin margin Ohio State loses by, and so we evaluate the Buckeyes coming out of that a little bit differently. And internally, that's how things get evaluated as well. When you come out on the losing side, if we do see this game again another time, or perhaps multiple more times <laughs> by the end of the full season, Ohio State will now come out of this game saying, how do we fix things to make sure that we can come out on the winning end? You know, the 12 men on the field flag, whether or not you actually lose time for that offensively, seems like college football may be the one to refine that. Things to learn for Jeremiah Smith, though, and it's an interpretation even on that call, which would have put the Buckeyes in field goal range on that decisive drive and perhaps an opportunity to kick a game winner. That call goes against Ohio State. And then, of course, Will Howard, the decision with the time remaining to take off and run. Didn't like his first read, didn't like his second read, takes off and runs, and so the clock runs out. Even that, a razor thin margin you see some of the memes on social media as receivers are running in signaling timeout was there a second remaining was there not a second remaining point being guys that yes this is a game Ohio State lost it's a game that for the second season in a row it feels a bit like the game in Ann Arbor to close out the season last year where they're that close to a game winning drive but it comes up short they got to figure out a way to get on the right side of it but it's not like Ohio State's far away this is not intended to be an easy path it was a matchup between two teams ranked in the top three, decided by one point. Right. The last time that happened was 1991, that legendary Florida State Miami oh, game, 17-16. Yeah. to 16. That was the last time a top three matchup was decided by only one point. Now, there's another Big Ten team still in the top five, and that is Penn State. And we were talking about, you know, how Oregon season, Ross, started kind of slow, and then they picked up, and now they're in a great spot. That was Penn State's game against USC. They're down 20-6. to six. And they showed some real pluck to come back and win it in overtime. Yeah, what a what a remarkable comeback. I, I wonder if the the Penn State teams, you know, of old uh, would have been able to do this. But Drew Aller, um, perhaps the game of his career, in, in, in tight end Tyler Warren, right? 17, 17 catches, 224 yards. The the guy had a, a snap at he snapped the ball at center, he caught the ball at tight end, <laughs> he threw a pass. And he, and he ran the ball, I think, once. It was, it was a, le a legendary uh, performance by Tyler Warren and, and Drew Aller, and that combination uh, is essentially why, uh, why the Nittany Lions were, were able to, to, come, uh, to come all the way back. And huge win, you know, road win. And it's something that one of those – it's one of those games, uh, Anthony, that, that feels like you kind of – at some point, every good team during the season – has one of these where you got to come back from and uh this feels like uh one that will kind of propel uh you know penn state forward into the championship race and a couple of aspects of it ross that i don't think should be lost in the result for penn state we know what the storyline has been about teams traveling multiple time zones this season penn state starting slow able to come back able to overcome that in their efforts against usc and then also i really loved the Trojans game plan in this game. They did what they could to neutralize that Penn State pass rush by utilizing the running backs in a way that we hadn't seen Lincoln Riley utilizing them in weeks. He utilized some creativity in the run game, had the screen game rolling as well to Woody Marks and, and to be able to make sure that that pass rush couldn't get home because Miller Moss had been getting hit a lot. He had been under siege at different points during the season. So I loved USC's game plan, really liked the way they executed it at a really high level. But Penn State, to Ross's point, was able to have this furious comeback, fight back into the game, get it to OT, have the defense come up with critical stops when it had to happen. And the defense has been a bit inconsistent this year. And so so while it certainly wasn't a thing of beauty throughout, but there's a reason that James Franklin talked about the flight home from Southern California being like the movie Soul Plane. I don't know if you've seen Soul Plane. I don't know if Ross has seen Soul Plane. But his point was, we're going to have a good time when we fly home from this one because it was a well-earned victory. They are now 6-0, and which is the exact same way they started last year. One final pop quiz. How many other teams besides Penn State have been 6-0 and the last two seasons? Oh, besides Penn State, each of the last two years. 
Really? They're the only I team in the country that. to do that. They okay. are now officially bowl eligible. But, of course, their sights are set higher than just a bowl game. Their sights are set on the playoff. And they're not the only team that is looking that way. Obviously, Oregon and Ohio State, too. But we're going to examine other squads that still have playoff hopes in the Big Ten that might have seemed crazy a month ago. There's a real case to be made for them. And when we return, who's your defensive player of the year in the league and on offense? And did Saturday night's result change who you think the coach of the year is? We'll discuss after this. All right, look at the Big Ten standings now, the top half of the conference as we are halfway through the season. Obviously, plenty of games still to come. But as you, you take a breath and realize we are at the halfway point, let's reassess. Thank you for actually taking a breath, Anthony. Yes. Let's reassess where we are, especially individually speaking. Let's give out some awards right now, our midseason Big Ten Conference awards. We're going to start off with Coach of the Year. Ross, I'm going to let you go first. Who's got it right now? Well, this could go to a few guys, obviously, but I, I'm going to pick Kirk Signetti at Indiana. The Hoosiers are 6-0 uh, and for the first time since 1967. And take a look at what uh, Signetti has done at a place that really is notoriously uh, somewhat underfunded in football and, and where it's just tough to win. There, When you look at um, you know their final six games, Anthony, the Hoosiers need just two wins to get to, to eight overall. And you want to know how many times Indiana has won eight football games in a season? They've been playing football there since 1887, and they've won eight games eight times. They won nine games just twice. So we could be looking at a really historic year here for Indiana, especially if they get to, for the first time ever, uh, a 10-win 10, 10 mark. So what he's done has just been phenomenal. Look, we talked about it, I remember, in the preseason. They had a lot of guys back early in this, the schedule, the early season schedule, made for the possibility of some wins. And not only did they get all this done in, in winning every game, they're doing it in, in pretty dominant fashion and with an offense that I think is ranked top five in the country. So hard not to, to pick Kurt to, uh, as my uh, coach of the year at the midway point. A historic start to the season for Indiana, there's no doubt about that. Not only the 6-0 and aspect of it, but the dominance that's there. Double-digit win after double-digit win over and over again. So I would certainly agree that Kurt Signetti, the leader at this point in the season, midway would be coach of the year. But I do think there's a lot of consideration worthy of giving to Matt Rule for what he's doing in Lincoln with Nebraska because there's some youth and inexperience in the lineup on offense. He's got a true freshman as a quarterback who at times has looked like a true freshman, but there's a control and a composure that Dylan Raiola is playing with that I don't think should be only solely credited to Dylan Raiola. You have a freshman quarterback who's in a good situation. It hasn't been a dominant run game for Nebraska, but it's been a forceful run game. It's been a utilized run game for the Huskers this season that aids in taking some pressure off of the young QB when he knows that every play call isn't just going to be up to him deciding a full field read, using his right arm to win the day for the Huskers. So I love that. And of course, what they've done defensively with Tony Elliott, you see a balance to the way that Nebraska operates and it's only year two for Matt Rule. And yes, there are close games that have been lost, close games that have been won though. So they're starting to get over that hump, not having as many critical errors in crucial moments. So I do like what Nebraska's done so far this season. If it's not, Kurt Signetti, I do think there's a strong case to be made so far for Matt Rule. Rule has done a great job. Lanning's been nice. Bielema's right. been nice. But Signetti's the national coach yeah. of the year right now. Agreed. I think we all agree on that. All right, how about offensive player of the year? I don't think we're going to have a lot of agreement on this one. Who are you going with? I'm going with Penn State running back Tyler Warren. No, I'm, I'm going with Penn State center Tyler <laughs> Warren. No, I'm, I'm actually I'm going with Penn State quarterback Tyler Warren. I, I mean Hang Penn on. State tight end <laughs> Tyler Warren. What he is doing in the numbers he's putting up as a pass receiver, the red zone weapon that he is. When you get into the red zone, you're either trying to create space or you're trying to create matchups. They do both with Tyler Warren because of the level of playmaker that he is when you get into that area of the field. And year after year throughout his Penn State career, this former high school quarterback has turned into one of the best blocking tight ends in the country as well. And they can align him anywhere. He can stalk block out in space. He can be at the end of the line of scrimmage, taking on a defensive end, climbing up to the second level, eating up linebackers, moving his feet, running his feet on contact. There's not a player who's been more impactful in a wide variety of ways for his team's offense than Tyler Warren has been for Penn State University. 
If he keeps this up, I do believe there should be Heisman consideration that's there as well. Now, can he keep the numbers up and would a tight end get Heisman consideration? I certainly hope so. If Penn State continues to climb as a squad, and if you see Tyler Warren doing what he's doing so far, guys, I do think there's a case to make. Ross? Well, yeah, we, the only place we haven't seen uh, Tyler Warren is defense, and I wonder if they won't throw <laughs> right. him over there for a few snaps, try to get him in that Heisman uh, uh, conversation. You know, uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to go with an Ohio State receiver, but it's probably not the receiver that you think. You know, a lot of love, I know, for, for Jer Jeremiah Smith this year, but I'm going to go with Emeka Ebuka. And, and I saw him in person in Eugene this past weekend. So, I mean, it might, it might seem a little bit out of, out of left field, but – uh, he's an incredibly talented guy. He was open time and time again. I think he ended up with 10 catches for 90 yards or so um, uh, against the Ducks. And it, he just knows how to get open. And then it's his running after the catch yards that were really, really impressive. You know, he's averaging about seven catches a game, top 20 nationally. He's got six touchdowns, top 15 nationally. Uh, the incredible thing is is what he does after the catch that's been uh, the most impressive. He's already got, I think, five more catches than he had all of last season when he fought off some injury and missed three or four games. So, yeah, give me – I know it's kind of an odd pick. Uh, how about this? Between us, Anthony, we don't have a quarterback as yeah, our not a offensive one. player of the year not at the midseason. I, wa I want to point out, like, nothing wrong with either of those picks. They're both very talented players. Okay. But, but we just but, talked about but, Dylan Gabriel. Yes, I like him. Second in the him. country in completion percentage. Caleb Johnson – is second in the country in rushing yards when everybody he plays knows they're not throwing the ball against him. And you guys went with a tight end and the second wide receiver at <laughs> Ohio State? I like your Caleb Johnson case. It's a strong one. Yeah? Yeah. Right. I'm on board with that. Right. Well, I'm pushing the Dylan Gabriel case then <laughs> as well. Uh, Ross, what about defensive player of the year? I think we might find more consensus here. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to go with the Penn State's Abdul Carter. Uh, you know, this is a player who made the move, Anthony, from linebacker to defensive end. And we talked about him a lot this year and that shift. He's got four sacks, leads one of the best defenses in the country. You remember uh, he dominated the game against Illinois and four tackles. Uh, for loss, two sacks, a forced fumble that basically ended the game. Just a real versatile player. I think that scouts probably salivate when they see him. 6'3", 260, who can kind of move around the field and, uh, and play at a variety of, of positions. And I'm going to go with the defensive lineman as well. Not exactly the guy you're going with, though, but someone who has actually wrecked shop his first season in the Big Ten. I'm going with Mikhail Kamar for Indiana. And what he's doing in sacks, in tackles for loss, amongst the conference leaders throughout the season so far. But the impact that he's had for the Indiana Hoosiers, where a lot of the headlines have gone to Indiana's offense. And he doesn't necessarily lead the Big Ten individually in either of those statistical categories, just amongst the leaders. But he would lead the Big Ten in juice. There's not a player <laughs> in this conference who provides more energy, more urgency to the teammates around him on defense than Mikhail Kamara does for the Hoosiers. And he's a closer. When it comes down to those moments in the game where Indiana is beginning to surge, is beginning to separate from the opponent in the fourth quarter, you want that guy that can close the show on the opponent. And we've seen game after game, Mikhail Kamara be that guy for the Hoosiers as well. When the quarterback drops back to pass, you know you've got them in a predictable down and distance. And he has just been unblockable in those scenarios. And the tenacity that he chased the ball with against athletic quarterbacks, stationary targets in the pocket, inside moves, edge rushes, the energy that he plays with. He reshaped his body over the offseason and talking to Kurt Signetti about that. He's been around Mikhail Kamara for years at this point, but said that's been one of the biggest differences in his game. He was very productive at JMU, but then went through this sort of reimagining of what he can be off the field and how he can be at the peak of his physical conditioning, and it shows up week after week. Not going to wow you statistically, but the intangibles he brings yeah. are so important for a defense, and I think you're right. That's getting overlooked. Indiana scored 40 points a game mm -hmm. in recent years. But they haven't been winning by double digits because they haven't had the defense that they've been getting this year. I really like the conversation around this last category. Yeah. Big Ten freshman of the year. I think there's a couple guys who could make a really strong case. Which one are you going with? A lot of options here. I I'm going to go with the guy that maybe feels like the obvious choice because of the highlight reel grabs that are seen by Jeremiah Smith. But beyond what we see from the one-handed catches that happen almost on a weekly basis at this point, there is such a maturity to his overall game. Like his, his approach to being competitive 
is the stuff of legend, and it's coming on the heels of Marvin Harrison Jr., what he was as a worker, what he was as a competitor in Columbus, so they know what that looks like to achieve greatness. And Jeremiah Smith is cut from a very similar cloth in that regard and is more physical mature than Marvin Harrison Jr. was when he showed up in Columbus as a freshman. So you're combining all those elements to be a guy who just seems like he's uncoverable. Whether you're going man coverage, zone coverage, you want to roll multiple players into his area, you want to throw the ball out of bounds into the fifth row, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Jeremiah Smith has showcased that he's got the ability to come up with plays every angle of the pass defense. He is a guy who can take the short pass, the intermediate pass, the deep ball. He's doing a lot of things that senior receivers struggle with doing. He's doing those as a true freshman. Your exaggerations are only barely exaggerations. Yeah, like He's been narrowly. so marvelous at right. grabbing the ball from wherever. He's got a touchdown grab every single game this year. But like I said, Ross, there's another freshman you could make a great case for, but on the other side of the ball. Yeah, I, le I left the obvious one for, for a way in there. To <laughs> Appreciate so, you. But I I'm going to take Coy Parrish, Minnesota, safety. Um, it, it, you know, he, he give, give some love to him, man. He, he, he's been incredible at the end of games. Two back-to-back, -back, I believe, game-ending interceptions for the Gophers. Uh, uh, the, the comeback against UCLA, of course, uh, mo most recently had the pick. Uh, through six games, he's... I think he's forced to fumble. He's got four picks uh, on this. It just, it's been remarkable to watch this kid play and run around the field. Um, he, he's, he isn't afraid to get into traffic, you know, of uh, PJ Fleck. In, in fact, uh, said, I think after the latest game that he's never coached a more confident player in his career, never met anything like him or anybody like him is what he said. And he's, he's showing that on the field. It's incredible awareness, speed. Um, and he's got that, uh, Anthony, he's got that kind of that quick twitch they call yeah. it when, when you're All in the right. secondary or receivers and you have that kind of just inane ability. And he seems like he's, he's got it. Yeah, there's a suddenness to his play. And some guys just do have that sort of innate knack for playmaking. And Cord Parrots is one of those guys who has it. He was blessed with it as a high school athlete and wasn't an early enrollee. He wasn't one of these guys who showed up last spring and was able to just really get ingrained in the program. Yes, he'd been around Gophers football for a couple of years already as they recruited him. But he got there in the summer because he wanted to do his senior season of basketball, his senior season of track and field. He did all those things and then showed up with just a couple of months to go before the season and is already one of the best young playmakers in Big Ten football. As that graphic was showing, four picks, second best among any individual in the country halfway through the season. The latest AP poll did come out in football. Once again, three Big Ten teams in the top four. It's only happened twice in the history of the conference, last week and this week. Indiana is 16, Illinois and Michigan, by the way, will be meeting up this weekend. They are both ranked as well. And you see all those teams in there. They're all teams that in the big picture have a belief that they have a shot at the playoff. We have a playoff that has gone from 4 to 12. It has tripled in size. And what that means is an early season loss is nowhere near as devastating as what it would have been the last decade or so. Ross, you wrote an article yesterday stating that right now 20 teams are still legitimately alive, nationally speaking, despite they have a loss already. That includes a handful of Big Ten squads. It does. It does. Let me, let me give you a number of uh, 78. That's the that's the number uh, that over the last 10 years ended the regular season with at least one loss. And, and we're in the top 11 and not to say the top 11 are automatically in an expanded playoff. But for the most part, you're going to get the top 10 top 11 programs into the playoff the way the format works. Now, the majority of those 78 from the last 10 years, 43 of them had at least two losses or three losses. So if your team has two losses, if your team has three losses, have no fear, right? It's still possible. Now, they may have to run the table, right? But it's still possible that they can get uh, into the playoff. And, and we'll, we'll certainly see probably, if you do the numbers, probably at least two, maybe three or even four teams make the playoff with two or, or three losses. And I would start probably with Illinois. It, it has one of the better, quote unquote, losses at Penn State. And they've got plenty of opportunity to build on that resume, right? They 
I traveled to Eugene later in the year. Um, uh, you know, a close loss to Eugene, certainly a win, but a close loss could could be good for the resume. Um, you know, uh, Nebraska is another team to, to watch. Now, they lost at home uh, to Illinois, um, which isn't great, a home loss. But if you look at the Huskers' schedule, they may be favored in, in all but maybe one, maybe two, two games the rest of the stretch. So a 10-2 and two Huskers team with losses to Illinois or, or Ohio State, uh, two potential playoff teams, uh, hey, they could still get in. And how about the Hawkeyes? You see them there uh, as Nebraska's season-ending opponent. But the Hawkeyes – Look at their schedule. The hard games are done. They have zero ranked teams remaining uh, on their schedule. So you could see a 10-2 and two Hawkeyes team uh, maybe squeak into the playoff, Anthony. It has a, a Florence in the Machine kind of vibe to it. The hard days are gone. I, I think that for whether you're talking Iowa, Nebraska, there are teams who are in the thick of this thing who are, who are trying to figure out who they are. Wisconsin starting to surge at this point. And so the expanded playoff keeps them right in the thick of the conversation where, you know, some of the preseason hopes for those fan bases were, were squarely situated. A team like Indiana intrigues me quite a bit as well because they've gone far beyond the preseason expectations in the first season of the Kurt Signetti era and now at 6-0. and There's no doubt. Yeah, Indiana runs the table. Right. They're good. They're in. But they got Ohio State waiting on them if there is a loss for the Hoosiers. You know, what, what does that end up meaning if they make the Big Ten championship game? Obviously, everything is still on the table there. But a loss or two if you end up in a situation where perhaps by the end of it, if Ohio State is the only team that's ranked that Indiana faces by the end of it, how does that impact? I'm curious for, for Ross's thoughts on that too because, guys, I, I, I do wonder what, what the brand of the squad, what the, the logo on the helmet, how much does that factor into this thing? Indiana, they're beyond what we thought they would be, but it, is Indiana a team that can sustain a defeat or two as you see it, Ross? Well, I think they can definitely sustain a defeat, right? It's the two losses – uh, that may may be trouble, right? Because if you look at the Big Ten, and this goes for the SEC, I think as well, you could have bunched up in each league three, maybe even four programs at ten and two. You know, you know, you could, and, and so that's a big cluster. And you wonder if you get that kind of cluster of ten and two programs, then yeah, Anthony, maybe you start looking at logos a little bit and it's a subject subjective uh, selection committee right it's it's people's people's opinions um it's not through automatic qualifiers it's not through an impartial computer so you do wonder if you're a team like indiana or illinois uh if your logo um will in some way hurt you i hope not right for their fault it, it shouldn't it shouldn't hurt you uh, but the best way to avoid that obviously anthony is keep on winning it it had better not come down to logos we got a huge problem Agreed. If, if somebody's saying well, there's a bunch of humans sitting in that room looking at all this stuff and those humans should know better. It should come down to facts on what did or didn't happen, mm -hmm. not on who was good 10 years ago, what program was good 40 years ago. I hope it does not at all come down to that. We would have big problems. Don't you agree? I, I agree. And the, the depth of the conference overall is one thing that's worthy of taking into deep account as well. Because if an 11-1 and Indiana doesn't even make the Big Ten championship game for some reason, then there's not that additional opportunity to bolster the resume or to secure a conference championship. But an 11-1 and regular season with as fantastic as Indiana has been this year, if their one loss only happened to be to Ohio State and the overall resume is still a bunch of good teams, but if there aren't nationally ranked wins that are there for the Hoosiers, then it should still be a resume worthy of that, even if it meant they finished as the third team in the Big Ten. Like These are the scenarios that are going to begin coming up in that room with all the other humans, humans and comparing like resumes, comparing like film, but it is an extremely subjective process. Agreed. But it should be subjective based on what happened, not on who was good with different coaches and different players in different years right. in different decades. It should be Agreed. just on what happened they're, this they're year. Be but to your a point, a bunch of different squads around the country, though, too. Agree. I, I hope it goes that way. But <laughs> like you said, there are humans on this thing, and we're all flawed. Looking around the Big Ten, it's time for Game Leaders presented by Gatorade. It just came out. 
earlier today. Preseason women's AP poll, the Big Ten well represented. How about the new schools? USC and UCLA both in the top five for the women. Those LA squads are going to be unbelievable. But don't forget your traditional old school Big Ten programs. Ohio State is loaded. Maryland's incredibly talented. Nebraska's got a lot of experience back. Indiana's really deep. Also receiving votes, Iowa. Don't overlook Iowa. I know Caitlin Clark's not there, Anthony. Let's go. I'm telling you. Lucy Olson coming in to replace her. That's going to be a good team. On to the big board we go. Here's a look at all the games coming your way this weekend, including on the Big Ten Network, we've got Wisconsin and Northwestern. That is at noon Eastern, 11 Central Time. Some other intriguing matchups you see there. Let's break down some of them. Ross, I got Nebraska playing Indiana. How about this? That's a 5-1 and one team hmm. playing a 6-0 and oh team. Hmm. Who'd have thunk it, right? Pretty, <laughs> pretty wild. Uh, uh, and, and Anthony, this, this one is a collision of contrasting styles, right? You got a scoring offense in, in Indiana that's, I think, second nationally, a scoring defense in Nebraska that's at seventh, um, something's got to give here. You know, the Huskers still have a, a game left on the schedule at Ohio State, so they really can't afford a loss here if, if they're going to remain alive for the playoff, which we just talked about in the previous segment. So this is somewhat for them. They're an eliminator type of range when they play these games, um, a much more important game for, for, for them. Uh, but the big matchup here, going back to it, is, is Nebraska's front. Um, in, in defensive front in D.C., Tony White, can he get enough pressure on, on Rourke uh, in Indiana? Nebraska's 10th nationally uh, with, with 20 sacks this year, Anthony. Uh, Indiana's top 15 in sacks allowed, not allowing sacks. They've only allowed six in six games. So uh, that's the big matchup I'm watching heading into this one. Yeah, I don't know how you block Ty Robinson. <laughs> That's a big issue. Most folks have tried. Most have failed. And for Indiana, perhaps schematically, they just say, we're not even going to try to block him. Just, just throw the ball over here, over there. Make the big guy run all over the place. The, the bye week should be something that came at a good time for each of these squads and for the Hoosiers to be able to come off of that bye week and be prepared for the physical battle that'll be there. I think more than a lot of teams would take advantage of sort of the mental time off and prepare for the next opponent schematically. They got to be prepared for a street fight against the Huskers and the physicality of the opponents that Indiana's facing has sort of ramped up here throughout the season game by game by game. And Nebraska is going to bring as much physicality to the fore in this one as anyone Indiana's played. That checklist that Matt Rule has of things he needs to do while rebuilding this program, he could get two of them done in this game. A win would give them six on the season, which would have them bowl eligible. A win would be against a ranked opponent, yeah, which they right. haven't done the last 25 times they've played a ranked opponent. Another matchup that's really interesting, Ross, historically speaking, outside of the fact that they're both ranked is Michigan, Illinois. It will be 100 years and one day since Illinois and Michigan played in the legendary Red Grange game. Yeah, we, we talked about the playoff stuff earlier in two loss Michigan, one loss Illinois. This this feels like an, a playoff eliminator um, completely, especially for the Wolverines. They've got to win to stay alive in the race. Uh, I feel like we ask this, Anthony, uh, every week. Has Michigan found a passing game yet? Will it find a passing game? Uh, can they can they get consistently uh, move the ball forward down the field uh, through the air? They'll be up against, of course, one of the best defenses. Um, play, playing pretty well right now, although uh, some hiccups uh, last week, right? Illinois was shredded a bit against a one in five Purdue team. So you wonder if uh, the Wolverines can exploit some of that. And Ross had a, talk, a chance to talk to Brett Bielema earlier this morning on Big Ten Radio and talking to him about this matchup coming off the heels of what was a little bit of a surprising finish to their game against Purdue. But Brett Bielema said that he felt like his team is very ready to be able to respond coming off of the way the game finished last week. And you can coach better off of a win when there's a lot of film for improvement to be made than sometimes you can coming off of a defeat. So this one is one to really look forward to, especially talking about physicality. If Illinois gets a win, that's three wins over teams that were ranked at the time they played them. Something they haven't done since resume. that 2007 season when they went to the Rose Bowl. For Ross and Anthony, I'm Mike. Thanks for watching.